Welcome. I'm Warno Deschalette, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Andrea Hope on November 30th, 2020. Andrea describes herself as a poet, mother, and world citizen. Her published poetry works include Will You Break the Silence? Poetic Practical Steps Toward Race Unity. And her other work is To Mother. She also posts a podcast called To Mother with Andrea Hope. We talk about all three in the interview. I started the interview by asking Andrea where she grew up and what was religious life like growing up. I actually grew up in Freeport, Bahamas, because my great-grandmother was a Baha'i. So she became a Baha'i in her 30s, and then she went pioneering, which is meaning that she went to go to another country or area to help the Baha'i community there. And she needed to go somewhere warm because she had some issues with her arthritis of her joints. So she ended up going to the Bahamas. And then my great-grandmother raised my mom and her brothers. And I ended up also being born in the Bahamas. So my great-grandmother being a Baha'i and having a very significant role in raising me along with my great-grandfather, who was also a Baha'i, Uh, Yeah, they taught me about the Baha'i faith, and I also went to Christian Baptist Church with my mom for several years, I would say probably until I was in middle school, and at a certain stage, I was kind of able to make my own decision about what I wanted to do, and I just remember I was always a very, very inquisitive kid in school and in after school activities and everything. And I remember that the Baha'i community was the one space where it was really encouraged. So sometimes Baha'is wouldn't know the answers to my questions, but I felt like there was a real enthusiasm to figure it out together or to learn about it. And so that really attracted me to staying with the Baha'i faith. And since I was a young child, I've just been actively involved. And you said it was your great grandparents or your great grandmother or just your grandmother? My great-grandmother, actually, yeah. The women in my family have children quite young, so she wasn't so much older. But yeah, I think she Mm. was probably in her 60s at the time. And do you know how she became a Baha'i? The general Mm. story is that she had to go to the hospital for treatment. And in the doctor's office that she was in, there was a poster, the, uh, The Earth is But One Country and Mankind Its Citizens. And she asked, oh, where's that poster from? And she tells me that her doctor was a really, really good teacher (laughs) of the faith because he knew that she was interested in science and religion. She was a math and science professor. So he said, oh, you come over to my house and my wife and I will tell you more about it. So she went to a few what were called firesides where they would gather together with the purpose of deepening in their understanding about the Baha'i faith or spirituality. And she said he really focused on this balance of this harmony of science and religion, which was really important to her being Catholic and also being a science and math professor. And that's really what drew her to the faith. And then my great grandfather, he was active with her for a while, but he actually didn't sign his card to be a Baha'i, to register officially as a Baha'i until a couple of years later. So that was always an interesting story in our family. Um, my grandmother used to, great-grandmother used to ask him every morning, oh, are you going to sign your card? <laughs> Which was kind <laughs> of a funny thing to do. And he would always say no. And then eventually he did sign and he said that he knew that if they were going to do it, it was a commitment that they needed to have as a family. So he wanted to make sure that my great-grandmother was fully committed to changing face before he also joined, but he was always very involved in it, and I think it was a really uh, wise and and wonderful thing that they could do together. Andrea, you're a poet. Uh, You've written a couple of works, one which is Will You Break the Silence? Poetic Practical Steps Toward Race Unity, and the other is To Mother, which we will get into shortly. But my first question is, when did you start writing poetry? The oldest poem that I can find that was kind of published was in fifth grade. I wrote a poem about a ghost. (laughs) (laughs) But that was very, like, 
you know, introductory to that. But the time that I could remember really diving into poetry was when I was around 11 years old. My great grandfather, who I talked about, passed away. And that was my first experience with death, like a close death, being in my family and someone who was so important to our family. And I remember at that time writing poem after poem after poem in this little notebook that I eventually gave to my great grandmother. And I didn't realize that it was something that was healing for me or therapeutic for me. At the time, it just naturally came out in that way. And then over time, I tried to, you know, cultivate my skills and learn more about it. But the first time I can remember performing poems was also around that time. I performed the poem in a beauty pageant, (laughs) which is in the common talent to have. I performed the poem in middle school in the beauty pageant, and I also actually performed a poem at my middle school graduation as a part of the ceremony. And what attracts you to poetry versus, let's say, prose? What drives you to write a poem? I think emotions. I have always been a very emotional person, and so growing up, I cried a lot. I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders a lot. I was definitely the kind of young person who felt, wow, there's so much suffering in the world and what can I do about it? Can I do anything about it? Which was also part of what attracted me to the Baha'i faith because I wanted to be an activist and I thought this is the such a way to be an activist that's loving and that isn't like against <laughs> anyone per se. And so I think it was really a way to express my emotions and to just get it out. But also I love language. Like I consistently use the dictionary and the thesaurus in my life. I have it bookmarked on my phone and my computer and everything. So I've always just loved language. I love imagery. I think sometimes with prose, I can get maybe overwhelmed (laughs) or maybe I don't have the attention span. So poetry is kind of an elevator pitch of your emotion, no reaction to something. So it's kind of an elevator pitch of your emotional reaction to something. And I really like reading poetry and editing poetry as well and performing poetry. Your poetry work entitled, Will You Break the Silence? Poetic Practical Steps Toward Race Unity. I mean, that's a very interesting title. What will readers find in this work of poetry? Yeah, so that book is actually just one brief poem with illustrations and it's purposely broken up to be just a couple lines in each page so that it can really be a point of reflection. So to give a summary of what happened leading up to that, I had a very strong emotional reaction to when Ahmad Arbery was killed earlier this year and he had the same birthday as me so I had this really strong emotional reaction and I had that experience as a child again where I felt like I'm not doing enough or what am I doing to help people and to spread love in the world and even though I know that I'm I'm actively engaged in community it just was very overwhelming feeling to me to feel like okay this person would have celebrated their birthday with me this year and they're not able to And then after that, I was kind of trying to figure out what I could do. And then a little while later, the news of George Floyd came out. And then at that point, I was just totally ignoring this story because I was too full of emotion to enter into another thing. But people kept posting about it and posting about it. And I thought, okay, I have to read about this and learn about this because I can't be blissfully ignorant. Like I have to be aware of what's going on in the country, even if it's uncomfortable. And so then after that, I created a video like a lot of African-American artists have done asking people to speak out and to have the conversations that, you know, dig into these issues and address these issues before they become dangerous and violent. And the response to that video was really heartwarming. So many people reached out saying, I wish I could do more, but I'm not sure what to do. Or, you know, I want you to know that I'm with you. And people emailed me personally. And so this book was really a response to all of the friends and allies who said, you know, I don't really know where to start with this. And so I wrote this poem that's basically some reflection questions to ask yourself and to think about uh, how you can contribute in your own space. And very thankfully, a few years ago, I was asked by Brilliant Star Magazine, which is 
a magazine for 8 to 12 year olds youth um, that highlights virtues and some of the Baha'i teachings to write an article on racial unity. So we had done a lot of research and surveys to people about what steps could be taken and how to address this in our community. So I heavily relied on the Baha'i writings and that research from Brilliant Star magazine to create this poem. Would you be willing to read the poem for us? Will you break the silence? Okay, will you break the silence? Dear friend, will you hold my hand, sit by my side, and listen to my pain? Will you welcome how discomfort feels as my tears flow free like rain? Will you bow your head to pray with me as the path revealed turns rough, remembering that prayer will rarely change things, rather prayer changes us? Will you strive to be a true friend to me, not just at work or school? Will you stroll around my neighborhood, invite me to your pool? Will you tell my story as vastly more than tales of struggle and strife? Will you utter the dreams of scholars and queens, the bright and bold of life? Will you consider both my future and my history? Will you ensure that equal also applies to opportunity? Will you break the silence and cry out when that beast of injustice bites? Will you hold our country responsible to uphold all of our rights? Will you embrace the many questions we'll face along the way? With faith and love, will you rise up? And will you rise today? So I'm speaking with Andrea Hope. She describes herself as a poet, mother, and world citizen. Her published poetry works include Will You Break the Silence? Poetic Practical Steps Toward Race Unity, and to mother. And we had just heard her recite the poem, Will You Break the Silence? She also hosts a podcast called To Mother with Andrea Hope. So another poetry work that you published is called To Mother. So tell us about that one. So that was the first book that I published. I have been performing poetry with the National Poetry Slam in the United States. And I've also performed in other countries, uh, in Tel Aviv, Israel, in the United Kingdom, in Liverpool, a couple of other places. And so I've done a lot of performance, but I haven't published a book of my written poetry. And I say that because I write differently for performance poetry than I write for written poetry, because for performance, it's kind of like a stand-up comedian where if the person doesn't get the joke or if the person doesn't get the line right away, then they don't really have that much time to think about it. So when I write for the stage, I write a lot more conversationally. But the poems that I've written for the page are more with the understanding that someone can take their time, they can reread it, they can gain their understanding as they go through the book. And so I wanted to publish some poems uh, separate from what I was doing on stage. And I was really just looking through the poems that I already had to see what kind of themes naturally are coming out in my poetry. And a very strong one was motherhood. I have a great relationship with my mother and uh, my great grandmother who passed away a couple of years ago. And then I have two children. Uh, my husband and I have a daughter and a son. And so this theme was really coming up a lot in my poetry and I decided to explore that more and so I divided it into four categories of the joy of motherhood, the heritage of motherhood in my family, the challenges of motherhood and the lessons that I've learned. So I divided to mother in um, mother land, mother load, mother temple, and mother tongue are the four sections of the book. Would you like to read a poem from To Mother? Sure. Okay, so I'll read the poem that is from the title of the book to Mother. And part of the purpose of the book was honoring motherhood, not just in the biological sense, though I believe that there is a very special connection um, biologically between parents and children, but also people who have been like mothers to us and the idea of mother in terms of like the mother book and religious history or this term of what it means to be a mother. So I tried to capture the different aspects of motherhood in this poem, which is the title of the book called To Mother. Mother land, mother load, mother temple, mother tongue, mother wake, mother work, mother worry, mother run. 
To your side, to your rescue, to your dreams, mother comes. By marriage, by fostering, by adoption, by birth. Mother of one, mother of all, godmother, mother earth. Mother to loss, mothers lost, mothers found, mother become. To uplift, to take pride, to sacrifice for another, to mother. So I'm speaking with Andrea Hope. She describes herself as a poet, mother, and world citizen. Her published poetry works include Will You Break the Silence? Poetic Practical Steps Toward Race Unity and To Mother, which she just read the title work from the poem To Mother. And she also hosts a podcast called To Mother with Andrea Hope. So let's talk about your podcast, uh, Andrea. What will people find when they subscribe to your podcast? Yeah, well, I have to say I was very much encouraged and inspired by this podcast called Happier with Gretchen Rubin. I don't know if listeners have heard of it, but uh, Gretchen Rubin, she's written several books about happiness and about balance. And I really loved her podcast where she gave practical tips and resources and she hosted it with her sister, Liz Craft. And she gives practical tips and resources that you can try every week to make your life happier. And they often talk about family life because they both have children. But I was listening to this podcast thinking, wow, it would be so great if I could have this kind of podcast that also had a spiritual component to it and that drew from the writings of the Baha'i faith and I couldn't find one so I said okay I'll make one so partially the podcast is for me (laughs) (laughs) to help me reflect on how to apply the writings of the Baha'i faith to being a mother or being a parent in general and so I try to be pretty disciplined about having a quote from the Baha'i writings on a particular topic whether that's infants or toddlers or whether that's celebrating holy days as a family or anything like that And then I try to give a living the life tip, which is a very practical tip of something that you could try out with your children or your family. And then I give a resource and I try to highlight a Baha'i artist or website or podcast or something like that, because at this stage in the Baha'i faith, sometimes it can be hard to find, you know, resources, where to find books or different music or projects or things like that. And then I often end with one of my poems. So because I have quite a few poems, (laughs) it was really natural to end with a poem or I choose someone else's poem that fits the subject and I read I read their poem. You have a current project in which you're working on the production of a children's book called Excuse Me, Teacher, which you describe as a picture book for super teachers. So what makes this book a picture book for super teachers? Yeah, well, this is my second picture book. I actually have a picture book called A is for Alawapa that is different terms from the Baha'i writings. And so I did that book, which specifically has terms that kids would find in the Baha'i writings. And then I wanted my next book to be something that would be more for uh, general communities to enjoy. And so I've always loved teachers. I've always felt that teachers deserve more respect and just their own award shows like they need a Grammys for teachers they actually do have uh, teacher award shows but they're you know not as as popular or as advertised um, but they do have international teacher award shows so I wanted to write something that celebrated the role of a teacher I think especially even during the pandemic people are understanding a bit more how much creativity and resourcefulness and really drive it takes to teach and so that's why I wrote this book excuse me teacher and I worked with a Brazilian artist to try and really make sure that the pictures reflected a diversity of experiences so there's a teacher in a wheelchair there's a Hispanic teacher on the cover there is a, you know teachers with glasses there's a part in the book where someone's speaking in sign language so I really tried to represent the diversity of the classrooms and also to have it be kind of whimsical and also educational. So there are pictures that combine like, you know, science, they're building this rocket ship with the cardboard boxes, but they're on the moon. So it's kind of combining fantasy and the realistic classroom environment. Why the title, excuse me, teacher? 
at least when I was little, I don't know about kids today. I have to ask my nieces and nephews. But that was a very common thing that you would hear. Excuse me, teacher. Excuse me. Can I go to the bathroom? Can I do this? Can I do that? So I thought it would be kind of a cute, a cute thing to, to title it. And how's the project going? Yeah, it's going well. We had a Kickstarter running from it that ended, and the project hasn't been fully funded yet. But I'm um, working with someone who is interested in pre-ordering some of the books. So the illustrations are done, and then we just need to see like when will be the best time to launch it and get it out there to people. I'm thinking maybe in the spring because that's around where Teacher Appreciation Week is, so that might be a great time to do it. Andrea, you have a website, andreahope.org. What will people find when they land on your page? Pretty much all the things we've talked yeah. about today. My website is ever evolving. I have to say I'm a, a type A personality and I'm one of those people who has more ideas than she has <laughs> time to execute them. So I feel like my pages and my website and everything is, is always evolving. But yeah, right now it has the links to my podcast to mother and to my books and then there's a page that's dedicated to children because in addition to to being a mom I also have a background in children's nonprofit education like working with children at nonprofit or after school programs so I try to put up crafts or different ideas of things that you can do to teach about virtues or teach about the Baha'i faith to children. Usually I also have a poetry editing page up there, but right now I'm taking a break because I'm working on a couple books and working from home with the two kids. That's about as much as I can do right now. But yeah, generally you'll find those three aspects, my poetry editing, my podcast, and my children's resources. Well, Andrea, I want to thank you so much for sharing with us your creative output. It's really quite interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Andrea Hope, poet, mother, and world citizen. You can find her online at andreahope.org. You can find this interview and other interviews on the website of com and on the YouTube channel A Baha'i Perspective. For information specifically on the Baha'i Faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org or you can call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective. Son of light, forget all, save me, and come you with my spirit, O oh, Son of light.
Cover my face with shame in thy presence and have burden my back before thee have intervened between me in thy beauty as countenance countenance I am aware O oh Lord that my And have hindered me on all sides, on all sides From gaining access unto the revelations of thy celestial power Glory be unto thee, thou didst create me when I was on existence Forgivest me not Who is there Then to grant Pardon And if thou Hast no mercy upon me Who is Capable of showing Compassion Glory Be unto thee Thou didst create me When I was on Existent When I was non-existent Be unto thee, be unto thee. And I was non existent, and I was non existent. Glory be unto thee, be unto thee. And I was non existent. What of the hidden sea? 
Lo, the creation hath passed away.
and moving from being locked into anger and outrage at war and violence or being defined as part of a protest movement to creating a culture of peace from the ground up and from the inside out. I am moving from reactive finger pointing condemnation and judgment of others arising out of my presumed superior moral positions to engage in dialogue, listening, and nonviolent communication strategies. I am moving from making those who disagree with us as the enemy to recognizing the inherent flaw in creating hostility or enmity as a peace strategy. In this way, my work attempts to dissolve polarizing approaches and behaviors. I am moving from demanding rights to assuming our responsibility to create environments which promote rights and emphasize individual and collective responsibility for an ecologically sustainable, socially just, democratically vibrant, and healthy world. I am moving from merely critiquing the absence of humanity in others to honing our collective capacities for compassionate action, deep empathy, and authentic forgiveness. I am a peace ambassador, and I am moving towards planetary peace. the day star of the heavens of my holiness of my holiness let not the defilement of the world eclipse thy splendor eclipse thy splendor